I was sitting in the cafeteria on the third floor and the power went out in the buildings. So I knew something big had happened. I was on hold like normal and they had a radio station. And I remember very specifically the music had stopped and they said, we have just, just in from our news bureau, a plane has struck the World Trade Center. I was in my office at 60 Hudson Street. Uh, I got a call from the commissioner and he said uh, a plane just uh, crashed into one of the towers and I'm monitoring the radios and I think they're gonna need some assistance PD down in the streets. So. I got a kick on my door uh, from my neighbor who was screaming through the door, uh, grab your camera, the World Trade Center's under attack. And then I laughed and I said, yeah, right. And I remember you know, walking over to my computer and I had nudged the screen and AOL Instant Messenger popped up and I saw the ticker on the top and it said trade centers are hit. And like, like the whole country, um, there were so many conflicting reports when the first tower was hit. Small Cessna hit it, helicopter hit it. Nobody knew exactly what was going on. And it wasn't until the second tower was hit that we knew we were under attack. I was a baby on 9-11, but I'm very well aware of the heroes that gave their life that day and rushed in as soon as the planes hit the towers. Pretty quickly after becoming a junior fireman, it became clear to me that there was a glimmer of hope that I could be a fireman in the greatest city in the world. We all came down in 1980, 81, to take the written test for the New York City Fire Department. July 11th, 1984, I was sworn in as a New York City firefighter. Maybe the greatest moment of my life. I had just spent a week in Disney with my sons, my wife, my family, and we were coming home. And we were all on the plane. It was a beautiful, beautiful, clear night. And my six-year-old said to my four-year-old, look, Mike, we're higher than the Twin Towers. And him and his, his brother, Stephen, shared this glorious view of flying over the Twin Towers. I just had a calling to come to New York City. I was going to the University of Texas at Austin and uh, I left my scholarship there uh, because I felt I belonged in New York City and uh, I wanted to shoot. That was my calling. So every morning I come here to clean the park, make sure there's no uh, debris, um, see who put something on the wall, see who put something at the base and then I'll stop here and I'll say hi to my friend, my dear friend Ray, who we lost in uh, May of 2017. Um, but on September 18th, these men and women will have their name read out loud, followed by the ringing of the bell, and um, we'll have a flyover. And uh, this, to me, this right here is never forgetting. 9-11 was that moment that really changed our lives. Um, it has a lasting impact, and there are people who have been shaped by that change and have been called upon, you know, personally to perpetuate that drive to fight terrorism. You know, it just brings comfort knowing that there are people that still find 9-11 relevant and still understand that the threats associated with 9-11 and the terrorism associated with 9-11 um, still drives people to enlist and drives people to uphold you know, the values in this country that you know, many of us still hold to such a high esteem. It's 8.52 here in New York. I'm Bryant Gumbel. We understand that there has been a plane crash on the uh, southern tip of Manhattan. I was a rugby player somewhat student um, at James Madison University and I remember you know walking over to my computer and I nudged the screen and AOL Instant Messenger popped up and I saw the ticker on the top and it said trade centers are hit. I was walking around my room and my phone rang and it was the old flip phone so I opened it up, pulled the antenna out and I answered it's my mom and she's like turn on the news. It's 8.54 right now. Stuart, can you tell me when this happened exactly? I would have to say about 10 minutes ago. So I was sitting in the cafeteria on the third floor eating my Cheerios, I had my tea, and the power went out in the building. So I knew something big had happened, but I didn't hear or see anything. The people who were sitting at the glass facing the North Tower all at once jumped up and started running toward the exit. I grabbed a young lady by the shoulders and kind of shook her back to reality. 
and I said, what happened? And she said, a plane hit the tower. And I knew it was time for my game face. And this was what we trained and drilled and trained and drilled for things like this. I was in my office at 60 Hudson Street. I got a call from the commissioner, who I used to work for when he was the four-star chief as his exec. And he said, a, a plane just crashed into one of the towers and I'm monitoring the radios and I think they're gonna need some assistance PD down in the streets. So I did that, put the order out, we evacuated, brought everybody downstairs and went to the first uh, NYPD lieutenant that I saw and asked him, I got 40 to 50 guys here, where, where would you like us to go? And he said, I could really use your help on both sides of the building because there's vehicles coming down from all different places from the city and uh, People are going to get hit by cars running out of the tower that's, on, that's been hit. I went to where the plaza opened up a little bit and it was full of debris. Building parts, plane parts, on fire, black smoke, white smoke, dust. And if you remember in the videos, all the paper flo floating down from the upper floors. It was Armageddon. I ran up to the roof of this very building and I opened the door. First thing I noticed was a beautiful blue sunny sky, 80 degrees, and then I saw a thick black smoke billowing out of the World Trade Center and I realized uh, we were in a lot of trouble. I got into the crowd and I got on the escalator. As I'm going down, the lobby of the North Tower reveals itself to me. And there are hundreds of firefighters awaiting their order to go up. And the firefighters have their bunker gear on, their turnout gear, and they all have yellow stri reflective stripes. And I chuckled because now I really understood why the cops called us bumblebees. Someone yells my name across the hive of the bumblebees and I can see my best friend, Captain Terry Hatton's face over the top of the bumblebees. So I ran into his arms and I wrapped my arms around him and he wrapped his arms around me and I got lost in his chest and his shoulder. And he leaned over and he kissed me on the cheek. And he said in my ear, I love you, brother. I may never see you again. Terry and the men of Rescue One made it to the 83rd floor of the North Tower where they were fighting the fire and saving people's lives when an interior collapse occurred. Terry knew it. I love you, brother. I may never see you again. He knew it. He still did it. He fulfilled his oath. And I went over and I turned on the television and I was watching in awe like everyone else in the world was. And as they panned out to another, you know, the, the fire and the damage and, and then we saw a second plane hit, the second tower. And that, I knew from that moment, it was a different world. It was a different world from, from what we knew just a few moments earlier. The leadership huddled up. We decided how to split our forces to manage the second biggest disaster in the history of the city of New York that was occurring at the exact same time as the first biggest disaster in the history of the city of New York. You can only imagine the amount of people in both of those buildings. Now we have two buildings on fire and people, the amount of people that are just running up from the towers is just unbelievable. I ran out the door on the south side of the South Tower, and that's Liberty Street. As soon as I got outside, the first thing I saw right there in my visual memory was a dead fireman who had been crushed by a woman who jumped or fell out of the building on the upper floors. And then I got a call from the commission on the radio that 
there's a possibility that one of the towers is going to collapse and to get everybody out of the street. The first indication was a very, very loud snap. And you can see the two towers, a huge explosion now raining debris on all of us. We better get out of the way! I yelled to the paramedics, follow me, and we ran right back into the Marriott Hotel, three World Trade Center. It was as clear as this room is, and that, like that, went pitch black. And somehow, I found this very large vertical steel column, and I wrapped my arms around it, and I held on with all my might. The wind was so strong that it blew my helmet off, and my legs were up in the air. And I held on with all my might. And I just remember thinking that I didn't want to die right now. I'm a faithful man, I, I don't, I'm not afraid of dying. But I just thought, not now. What happened? It collapsed. The top floors collapsed down. Oh, uh, a lot of things changed. A lot of things changed that day uh, as everything developed. We had Shanksville, we had the Pentagon, we had so many different moving parts on a, on a news day. Eventually, you know, just trying to make sense of what was going on, eventually witnessed the two buildings collapse. The buildings collapse. I, I, to this day, I, I can't even describe the it just took your breath away. It was just an incident where you just, you could not even comprehend what you were seeing. You could not comprehend what you were seeing. I saw the tower was collapsing and that was the final frame on my uh, camera. About 30 minutes later, I was uh, sitting right here and my mother said, don't you dare go down there. And I said, mom, I promise I won't. But about 30, 40 minutes later, I had to. So I ran down there and it was chaos. But I, oddly enough, I stopped documenting quickly because there was something called the Bucket Brigade going on where they were trying to clear debris to find victims. And so I got into the Bucket Brigade and I began doing what everyone else was doing and trying to clear the uh, rubble to try to find victims. And then a little while after the second tower collapsed and then Manhattan went into nighttime. And I sat there with my commissioner and some of his staff, and we just were in disbelief that now two buildings collapsed. We sat there for a while, I don't know how long, but he said we got to go down and see what's going on down there. So we left uh, 60 Hudson Street, got into our vehicles, and we headed down to Ground Zero. 12 hours later, 13 hours later, I found myself there, and um, I don't think any of us that day, a week later, a month later, 20 years later, a program to fully digest and absorb the devastation and the destruction that we saw, the carnage. Within a very, very short period of time, I guess the police departments, the fire departments realized that the easiest way to, to rally the troops to get everybody back to work was to just go over the news. I tried to contact a few people, uh, one of them my union delegate, and I managed to get him on the phone. He was on his way there, and I believe I asked them, and I said, how many, how many cops and firemen do you think are, are gone? I'll never forget his word. He said, thousands. I said, thousands? I, I, you know, and then I, I just, I remember saying to myself, oh, you have to know, you have to know somebody. How could you not know someone who has, who's, who's in those towers right now? Every morning at like 6 a.m., there'd be a meeting in these little wooden shanties that were built, and they would come out with uh, what teams of firefighters would be digging in which section of Ground Zero. The image that folks around the country have of, you know, firefighters, FDNY firefighters, big, tough, burly guys, and they are. But at Ground Zero, they were more like uh, archaeologists, and they had little tiny digging tools, and they were very refined, and they were trying to find any remnants of a victim because at that point, many families had absolutely nothing to, they had no remains. They couldn't even have a proper funeral. And so I was very 
struck by the sensitive nature and the detail that the firefighters, uh, FDNY, were paying towards trying to find any little piece of a of a 9/11 victim that they could. You know, we were attacked, and. We were in shock. How can the United States be attacked? We're the greatest nation in the world. And then that went to sorrow because of all the innocent lives lost. But then it went to anger. Oh, we gotta bomb somebody. What the, who, who, who has the audacity to attack us? But then that charity, that humanity, that love, that empathy, it just, it spread like wildfire. Man, I wish we would've bottled it. My phone rang again, it was my mom, and she said, Hey, I, we got a call. We had heard from our neighbor, a guy named Bruce Eagleson. His son, Tim, was a friend of mine, grew up in the neighborhood, and he worked for the Westfield Corporation. He was in one of the towers, and he had come down. He had called his family and said, hey, I'm okay, but my teammates are still up in the tower. So he went back up there, and they never heard from him again. So I woke up um, on 9-11 uh, in a haze, and it became you know, very, very clear, very, very quickly, the events that were unfolding. and it. I remember it kind of woke me up as to there's something I need to do next. 9-11 did not end on 9-11. This, this is an incident, an event, that should never, ever be forgotten. Never be forgotten. And, you know, you have, I was diagnosed with cancer 19 years, 19 years after my service at, at the World Trade Center. Did I think, you know, there was 71 recognized cancers and I, I that list grows. It's sad, it's sad. Um, there's a lot of people who aren't gonna be playing with their grandchildren. I got sick, I retired in 04, but uh, the end of 05, I started getting really sick. Uh, I couldn't walk more than like 20 feet and uh, went to see my medical doctor and uh, he started doing some tests on me, did an EKG, he didn't like the way he looked. Found that I needed to have a quadruple bypass and there was no family history, never smoked, wasn't really overweight and they just couldn't figure out why a guy so young shouldn't have these kind of conditions. You have two types of folks that can learn from this museum. You've got the generation that wasn't born and that now it's history for them and it's important they learn about what happened and then you have folks who did live through it who perhaps want to learn a little bit more about what happened uh, on 9-11 and the nine months that followed so it serves I guess to uh, I don't know if the word demographic is the right word but two types of uh, audiences those that were around and those that weren't around and now they need to learn about it. Good will overcome evil, even though evil will strike. Humanity is good, we are good, and we don't tolerate evil. We call evil what it was. We know the amount of innocent life lost that day, but there were men and women running into harm's way while tens of thousands were running away, and um, those in law enforcement and firefighters and, um, and our military. That oath is for a small percentage that live it every day while they're serving and when they're out of service. Obviously it happened when I was yeah, still a baby, but if you're in a tough situations, say you're deployed, whatever, I think thinking about that would give you a lot of inspiration, seeing what they did. They gave their lives for their country. They protected their country no matter what. You know, I think there's a lot of inspiration taken from that. It didn't matter where you live, what uniform you wore, or even if you wore a uniform. On that day, we came together as Americans and the heroes that are on this wall and the heroes that we continue to put on this wall every year, they will never be forgotten. And I know my 24 corrections that are on this wall, my brothers and sisters, I will make sure their families are taken care of as long as I'm around. There's a poem by Linda Ellis, and it's called The Dash. 
the people on the other engraved on the other side of the wall and the other many who will be added this year and every other year, their dash meant something. And although it has the date of birth and the date of death, what's important and what we should remember is everything that's in that, the smallest part of that engraving, and that's the dash. And that's what I want these people to remember by, their dash. Thank you.